Hey everyone, it's Classic DM, and we're going to continue our conversation about the Hidden Shrine of Tomoa Sean. Um, as promised, I wanted to make sure that I maintain my AD&D uh, subscribers with cool content to take a look at. And as promised in the previous uh, Hidden Shrine of Tomoa Sean video, what we're going to look at today is the actual design of the first room and how to run it. Um, some things about it that are really, uh, really, really cool, that are really interesting, that will probably never happen to most people, and ways you can kind of prompt that kind of stuff to happen. So let's just go ahead and get started right away. So uh, you've, you've seen the dungeon before, you maybe played it a long time ago, you know, a lot of this conversation today is going to really kind of angle in on people who haven't ever played it or played it a long time ago when they were a little kid and they haven't played it since, it's their all time favorite. I'm not going to give you a big overview on it because the other video does that. What we're going to talk about is this first room, okay? So let's just jump right in and uh, start talking about it. Now, if you, one thing you may remember in the previous video, which I have made a long time ago actually, we have our pre-generated characters and uh, the, the stats on Ryle were wrong. I never updated. He had some Mercedes old stats from the other adventures. So we have our three pre-generated characters. That's fine. We're not going to play it. And one of the key things in this first room when you start playing is you have to notice that the first original version, which is the crappy one you see at the top of my chicken scratches all over it, and the reprint of it are available PDF on DriveThroughRPG.com. They're they're different. The, um, there's slight differences here. Where's Waldo? Right. See if you can see the differences. <clears throat> well. The squares in the original one were one square equals five feet, so they just, you know, they changed it to one square equals ten feet. A lot of the old A, D, and D modules have one equal ten feet, but they moved uh, the circular thing that you see here, which we'll talk about in a minute. The still the top is north, right? That's still the same. They changed some of the distances, like this is ten feet. In the original one, it was only like five, and there's double doors here, and they have this tiny little door drawn here. And because I'm a level designer in the game industry, I'm super picky. <laughs> You're going to hear me talk about a lot of stuff in a three-dimensional sense. Because AD&D is a three-dimensional game. Even though you don't have any graphics or real-time lighting and PBR materials and all this kind of crap happening, you still want the world to be described and f you want to understand that room. Because as boring as a 50 by 30 room can be, this is probably one of the most interesting rooms done of any of the A&D modules back in the old days. And that's one of the reasons why I love it. Even the first room itself is cool. So it, try not to get too distracted by that. Personally, because I'm old school, the one I grew up with, I'm using that. I'm not using this redone one where someone like changed the distances between the niches and moved this thing up into the middle. I don't know who did this graphic. I, whoever the graphic artist guy didn't understand the design behind the first one. So we're going to be old school and grumpy about that, okay? So let's talk about the room first as, as if you were actually playing the adventure, right? Let's just share that information with you. So when it says the key to the lower chambers, the vault, I'm going to try to say this, right? Because I say a lot of words wrong. It's very funny. The vault of Chico must talk. <laughs> you gotta laugh. The place of seven caves. There's not a single freaking cave in the whole adventure, dude. I have no idea what they're talking. <laughs> Maybe if you go off to the distant west beyond the crumbled in thing. I mean, this, this, they even mentioned this whole thing. It could have extended. Who knows what could have been out there. You could have made another whole universe out here. I mean, this temple is huge. It'd take you a whole summertime to run it. But with this massive cave in and everyone's kind of slid down, you've got these three characters. I'll just use these jokers here as placeholders for like, the magic user thief and the uh, barbarian tribal warrior type dude and the cleric. The cleric's actually a female. We just put these guys in here for the time being. But there's no seven caves or anything, so maybe that's over this way that we don't get to experience, right? So th this thing was designed to be a tournament, right? So when you're reading through this, you're going to have to make a decision. Some of the tournament descriptions are... Uh, almost prose, which I like because I like to write, right? Um, but it's third person, omniscient narration. So you'll see the second boxed text here, which I'll read to you in a second, is really omniscient narration, like you're reading a novel. <clears throat> so in tournament play, they're handing you these characters to play. I encourage you to actually do the same thing, like play with your kids, right? Play with your kids, say, hey, you're going to play this guy, you're going to play this girl. You know, let one person control two if you only got two kids or whatever. Let your friends play it. Get your old buddies together from college or whatever. Play the original characters, because that's what it was designed to. Don't bring your overpowered illusionist gnome in there, right? So um, right off the bat, some of these texts here that are in these boxes, you'll want to read for sure. And there's subtleties to how they're written that will make things confusing for people, which I want to clarify today. And then there's some of these things written like this that are omniscient narration, which means like reading a book. It's in third person. So it's up to you whether you want to use them or not. All right, let's get on with it. So this first one right here is kind of like what you would read to the players well, the moment they come in the room. Now, this is pitch black when things start. But you know, when I draw battle maps, I draw the whole room. Sometimes, I'll, that's why I use this glass thing. A lot of times you'll see me all do things like this. Like I'll block everything off with black. And that's just to let the players know, like tactically, you can't see there, right? Obviously, you can freaking see it. But I usually will do that just so people tactically um, 
won't see there. So what I can I know as a as a dungeon master that if I've got something coming to the door, I know that I may have an enemy coming to the door, but I won't put it on the board because they don't see it. So that's kind of a fog of war type of thing I like to do. It kills uh, dry erase markers really quickly too, which is wonderful. So expo be damned. So here we go, right? Breathing heavily, you find that the world has stopped tumbling and you now sit on a cold, damp stone. The coughing and wheezing of your companions can be heard nearby, hidden in the darkness. To your back are rough rocks of broken earth. As you sit, assuming you're not face planted on your face and scratch your face up, to your back are rough rocks and broken earth. Uh, as you sit, sorry, I'm repeating myself, the rumble and the clatter of rocks diminishes to the occasional rattle of pebbles and the shush shush of sliding dirt. Hey, that's great. So here's the key stuff with these old school, old school dungeons, right? Read this really, really carefully. So you need to know this. Because they have this poison gas thing going through the whole lower level of the whole entire dungeon, um, it changes how light works. So imagine like being in a nasty deep fog and you turn on your flashlight or light on your phone. You know, the light only goes so far. It's being re I've driven a car in a s blinding snowstorm coming home from Ubisoft, going to St. Jean sur Richelieu once. It took me three hours to go 45 miles at like eight o'clock at night in the middle of winter. It was terrible. I couldn't see more than five feet in front of me. It was really scary. And putting the high beams on fog lights, it didn't do anything. If you live up north or somewhere where it snows, you know what I'm talking about. Unless a light is made, the room shall be described by what the characters can touch only. You know, that's an interesting thing. It's a real nice subtlety. If you and I were really there, you, we, the players see this, right? They see the whole room. They're like, oh, I'm gonna go check out the niche. Like, you actually have to remember that you dudes can't see that, man. So you're in a pitch black room. So if you want to be a really hardcore DM, you could do something like, you know, put the three characters down on the table, right? And if you got a battle map that you're going to draw dry erase markers on, you could just say, you could just draw a couple of little lines to represent like stones. Like here's mortar joints and stones and you don't know where you are. And you could actually make them start moving around. And as they start moving around, then you can start doing things like drawing the niche, what they could see. So you could progressively draw and reveal um, as, you, as you play. A buddy of mine I used to play with who went to Florida State University, he had this big, awesome four foot by eight foot piece of three quarter inch plywood that he had a massive white paper grid on and a big long sheet excuse me a big long sheet of uh, vinyl and he used wet erase markers to draw up the whole thing it was amazing but if someone rest their tape hand on it it would just rub it all off all right so the light problem right because all the poison gas and stuff drifting around in here you know those kinds of things are going to settle to the bottom of the floor but because of that um, you're only able to see 10 feet around you so let's read this carefully a light spell will work normally, but any fire will only glow redly, means it's going to kind of glow red, a pale ember of itself as a result of the poisonous gas present in the air. You can imagine there's not enough oxygen really for the, the poison to be consumed properly. You know, a torch is really like bright white in the middle and orange on the outside. So torchlight isn't going to do a really great job. So let's just say someone decides to light a, a torch right here. So, you know, you're going to go out five feet from the character and go around. So you're going to talk about a radius like this big, maybe at most. This is a tent. This is one of these, each one of these squares is five feet. So the radius of a torch, it's really small. And I think for a dungeon like this, you really kind of do want to play it hardcore like that. That's where some of the magic and the mystery comes from. Using a torch and moving around, kind of feeling when in the dark, it's kind of scary. You have no idea how far this goes. Now, when you use a battle map like I have, it kind of kills the illusion. So if you can get a system where you can draw it out, I'm using the battle map because we're just using it for conversation. It's a really neat way to play, is to make the players walk around and partially start revealing. If you ever played Age of Empires or any, any real-time strategy games, you know that like you got to walk around and find your fog of war for see where all the resources are. So the, here's where we start talking about the, uh, you know, Ryle the barbarian sits quietly, nose raised, sift, uh, sniffing carefully. After a moment, he for his fears confirmed. He informs of the two, the air in this place is bad, poisonous. I fear that we are entombed in this place an hour from now. We shall never leave. Obviously, that's a device that lets you know that the poison feels like it's going to last about an hour. There's a way for the DM to actually communicate that to you. Uh, I don't really like the method that they're using where they're saying, hey, you're playing this character. Um, you know, here you are, dude. You're going to be playing this guy right here. And let me just go ahead and put words in your mouth. So let the, and the player really needs to adopt that character. I wouldn't read that kind of stuff. You know, I would inform the players that, you know, you, you have this gas. It smells really weird. Um, you know, he would know. He would know because of what his background as an Ullman Empire person. He would know what that smell is. 
you know, maybe it's made from some kind of uh, stuff that bubbles up from under the ground or some kind of nasty roots or decay or whatever, whatever the source is. He may have smelled this natural poison kind of gas smell before. If you remember the previous episode we talked about in the world of Greyhawk, some of the entries for the savages in the uh, Medio jungle, talk about using poison darts and stuff. So he's the guy from the region. So what you could actually just tell the DM, say, listen, your character's going to notice that there's going to be poison gas in the first area. You can kind of tell the other players in the room that, that this is seems like it's poison gas. Or you can run it some other way. You can make someone make a check. I don't think it's worth it. I think the character would recognize that right away. All right, so let's just go back to the uh, description of the room. So once you get past that initial step of people bumbling around and figuring out where things are, you can go ahead and start giving them a description of the full room itself, right? Which is going to be uh, this area right here. That's right. Let me just do this real quick. Don't want a bunch of LinkedIn notifications while I'm doing this. Thank you. All right. All right. <coughs> I won't complain anymore. So let's assume that your players have figured out how to get a light source going, right? Obviously, you know which character could be casting light. It's going to be the, the thief, the thief magic user guy. Um, so you, they finally figure out the, the width and the breadth and the size of the room. You want to start describing things in overall. And I've got a couple other extra cool sketches I've done to uh, show what that looks like. So you've got the, uh, you know, you've got the characters that are standing there. They've got this big weird thing in front of them. They've got these niches. Let's go to the next description now, right? You're in a long, narrow chamber running east-west. Remember, north is the top, so this is east-west. In the center of this apartment is a domed shape on the is a dome shape on the floor. So they're talking about this is talking about this, right? So this is a dome shape on the floor. So here's like what a dome would look like. Now they're going to talk about how tall it is in relation to a person, all that kind of stuff too. In fact, I have a section I'll show you in a few minutes that draws it for you. I already drew it earlier on a marker board. In the east wall is a blank faced stone door. That's not exactly true. Later on, it describes the door in detail, what it looks like. So it isn't a blank faced stone door. It actually got a nice detail to it. When we get to the second page, you'll pick up on that. So if you're really, really good DM, pick up on those discrepancies. A lot of times when people are writing these dungeons or writing these modules, there could be multiple people touching it at once. Someone writes the first thing, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a nondescript stone door. And someone else says, oh, I'm describing the door and how to open it with the key. Let me make this beautiful sun god design on it. So make sure there's consistency because players are listening to your words, right? They really rely heavily on you to give them really accurate descriptions. You know, if you say it's a ferry with a wooden bottom on it, and then later on you talk about you're on the deck of the metal ferry, they'll be like, huh? And so people can get confused. So that's kind of a little bit of discrepancy. Um, so this blank-faced uh, stone door at the west end is blocked by fallen stone and rubble, apparently the result of collapse. The two side walls appear to have several niches cut in them. Yes, there's six altogether. The shape in the center of the chamber appears to be a small alcove protected by a half dome with the open end facing towards a door in the east wall. The alcove set in a recessed shallow tiled well, one foot deep, ten feet wide. The alcove itself is four feet high. The hollow seems to hold some sort of display. The display appears to be... Now, here's where I want to switch over to something else real quick. So we're talking about this thing here, right? Let's give you a sense of what this space is really kind of like before we go too far along, because I did a couple of cool, fun sketches of it. Let's just get rid of this little super duper mini cam on the table here, and we'll just move this bad boy out of the way. And these kids, you can slide over here. So the first thing we want to do, I did this little sketch for you, right? So here's this cool little freehand, I call it a section. So if you're in the dungeon, you're looking north, this is kind of what you're seeing. So and all this black junk is dirt. So you have this, this is where you came in, you kind of slid down and fell down here, and you start the dungeon, start walking around. You got this really tall ceiling. Now in the dungeon, normally all the ceilings are like 20 feet tall. So this is always like 20, right? And it says everything else is from 20 to 40. So just pick some height. You know, describe some beautiful trim piece. It's up high. Make it vaulted if you want to. You know, vault the ceiling. Something that's going to be like a half circle like this, right? Like a barrel vault. Um, do whatever you want architecturally. It doesn't really affect the gameplay, but you want people to really feel like, hey, I'm really in this cool ancient tomb, right? So this is the dome. Now, what the dome does is it's not a complete complete dome like this. And it's not like the super dome or something in New Orleans. It's actually a half dome. And so there's niches beyond. So you're seeing these three niches beyond. We got a little goofy character here for scale. And here's a door and this is a passageway. So this thing recesses down one foot down, but it has an opening that you can actually look inside. And inside that half opening is this like diorama scene. Okay. So let's just get that out of the way, out of the way here. And let's, let's show you this other chicken scratch, a little isometric sketch I did to kind of help 
describe because when I'm DMing, I draw the stuff for people on the fly and I just erase it. It helps people kind of understand what some stuff is. If you want to sketch stuff ahead of time, that's awesome. So this is kind of looking isometrically like we were with our, uh, with our little crappy camera. Where's our crap cam? Let's turn on crap cam. Okay, here's crap cam, right? So you kind of look in the same direction as that and let's pull it up more like this, right? So if you look at the map like that, it would be more like that. Let's turn that off because now we're getting people who have retina damage. All right, cool. So this is like an isometric view. So if you were up high, kind of like Diablo camera, right? So here's the rubble, right? You got niches that are here being, you know, called away so you can see. You got three niches on this side, three niches on this side, the cool sun god type doors open here. Here's a dude with a, you know, torch lit, only can see about 10 feet around him in a sphere. Remember, torch, the light source is up, held over his head or wherever it is. It may not even hardly touch the floor. And you got this dome. So it's kind of half dome recess it's kind of modern looking if you think about it not a lot of domes in uh, mesoamerican architecture so it's probably something made out of plaster or something like that that gives you a sense of, like what the room is so it'll be good for you to have these kind of little rough sketches with you because when you start talking about you know niche one and niche two and niche three and niche four sometimes just having the big flat boring map isn't all that awesome People have a tough time. Some people have a really tough time visualizing stuff in uh, three dimension. So anything you can do to help give them an example, even if you like went to National Geographic and pulled a picture from National Geographic and said, it kind of sort of looks like this, like, or take a level designer tool like the Unreal Engine and build a little basic boxy room or use Google SketchUp. There's all kinds of neat ways you could do to make your dungeons kind of feel more alive. You could take screenshots from a game, like run around Elder Scrolls Online and take a cool screenshot of some free-to-play game. And say it's kind of like this big room like this, these cool torches and everything. Anything you can do to kind of capture the drama and the excitement of what it's like to be in this room. Okay, let's get into more details now about, let's not on the level design crap, about what's going on with this room. So this is the one thing about it that's so cool and so magical, but such a missed opportunity is how to get the damn door open. Because in the tournament play, the door can only be opened by a key. And the way that players are gonna find that key is like almost next to nothing. It's really, 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 really low, low, low chances for someone finding the key. And let me just read that to you. It's such a great idea. As a DM, you're gonna have to give, you're almost gonna have to like force people to find this key. You're gonna wanna maybe change the description of what the key looks like. Let's read it as is first. And we'll have a quick little conversation about what could you do to make it cooler than it is right now, right? So the staff, actually we need to read what's inside the dome first, right? The display appears to be a diorama depicting a hunting party of Ullman warriors. Remember one of your characters in the group, the Rael the Wanderer, he's an Ullman, an Ullman warrior. Let's just put this in a highlighter. In feathers and deer hide garments, in a mountainside scene, some have successfully pulled down a stag with the aid of a dog. Another group is cleaning a small mule deer, and the last party has cornered a puma with their spears. A scout watches the puma or puma hunt from an outcropping above. He holds a metal staff with a loop in its end. It looks like a shepherd's crook. It's almost like two full sentences to describing the shepherd's crook. That's kind of a giveaway. That's one thing about the old D&D modules that sometimes like, we want to kind of make sure you find out about it. But if you were actually really there, like for example, at uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, what, at Stone Mountain, they have a diorama of a Civil War battle, right? And if you've ever seen, if you've been to Williamsburg or some places, you've seen these dioramas of like, there's a beautiful diorama of the Battle of Waterloo that someone in one of the historical wargaming groups did. My producer pup's trying to jump my lap. <laughs> um, so. You know, if you've ever seen a diorama, it's like, wow, look at all these figures, look at all the scale stuff. You know, a lot of times it's a larger scale than the 28 millimeter WizKid minis we use or the stuff we use for um, wargaming like Black Powder and Hail Caesar. So having a little detail like that is easily missed. Let's just take an example here, right? Let's just use this stupid bones, horribly painted miniature of mine, right? Looks like complete crap, but hey, at least it's not white. So what was what that dude holding in his hand? <laughs> it's a crappy black staff with a big blob of gold paint on it, right? Now I feel sure that, oh, it looks like it has some kind of a white ribbon on the back of it flowing in the wind with his clunky, crappy red cloak. Man, I'm terrible at painting minis. I should pay someone to do these, but I don't feel like it. So, you know, what are the odds in some diorama with all that kind of cool stuff for someone to notice that one character is standing way up on the hill and has a crook in its hand that holds a metal staff with a loop in its end. In its end. You're like, yeah, so what? I mean, no one's gonna pick that up. People might, they're gonna spend more time trying to figure out, well, what can you do with it? Is there a lever I can pull? And usually, when this is the first most exciting focal point of exploration in the first room, 
they hadn't even thought about leaving the room yet. They want to exhaust all the fun gameplay and the stuff that's hidden away in the in this cool tomb. It's the Shrine of Tomoashan. It looks like pyramids. They want to know what's in here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here. And you know what most players are going to be thinking? I bet you do something with this and stuff in here comes alive and tries to kill us. They're thinking this is the relationship, okay? This is what the players are thinking about. They're thinking this is a central element, right? And these six pieces do something in a certain order, or maybe I find something to move it, or we have to fight something after we kill them, this is gonna open up and we can get in here and it goes down. Like that's all the kind of stuff they're thinking of. They think this is another damn Tomb of Horrors door right here that's just gonna kill you. That's what most players are gonna be thinking about. They're actually so excited about this focal point in the room that they're not gonna, they're gonna sit and get frustrated if they realize like after they've explored the entire room, the only two things that can possibly happen is getting the key to use to open the top of the door and picking up a figure from any of the settings and setting it on the damn floor. So I, I really think you need to change that kind of element. Let's go through it all and then we'll talk about the details of that, okay? Whoops. So besides that, the staff, you know, which looks like a shepherd's crook, is the key and may be separated from the figure without affecting it. Well, okay, that's cool. That makes sense. In tournament play, they say that a lot, just in your play, right? The key is used to open the door to the room. In the campaign adventure, the key can be used to work as a lock at the top of the mountain, which allows the well to be opened. This can be provide access to lower levels. So this is like, uh, well, that's not going to help you, right? So just keep it with the campaign thing. Like the, the crook, the key could be the key used to open the door, but you really want the players to kind of explore the whole room first and maybe get into trouble and maybe have the first combat situation and even you know, use this room as a place to camp. You may you may even want to make it so that once they've defeated the first room, that maybe some rubble comes out, enough air comes there so some of the poison can come out so you don't have to deal with the poison the whole time. It's really up to you. So how do you get that to happen? They didn't find the crook. They go, they're like, well, I didn't see anything. I'm going to go check this out while Billy's looking at this and Johnny's looking at that. So you start having this happen. So the guy looks at the diorama. You read it to him. He might even say, can you read it to me again? So he said, the display appears to be a diorama depicting a hunting party of almond warriors in feathers and deer hide garments. And that draws attention to them, right? You think, ooh, warriors, everybody come alive. I mess with them, right? And a mountainside scene. Someone successfully pulled down a stag with the aid of a dog. Uh, that could be an animated you know, war dog or something. Another group is cleaning a small mule deer, and the last party is cornered up puma with spears. So the player's thinking, oh, I bet that puma comes alive. I bet that dog comes alive. I bet that warrior comes alive. I better be careful. I wonder if I have to defeat them first to get the door to open. Because if somebody might have zipped on over to the door carefully and listened at it and hidden in shadows and try to open locks and do all this other thief stuff, right? And, or in our monk stuff, and none of it ever works. So they're like, hmm, it's a puzzle. How do we get the door open? So I really think the whole, uh, the loop in it's in and the shepherd's crook, when you're playing as a DM and you're making this happen and your party can't figure that crap out, you almost feel like you should just give it to them, but try not to do that. Try to find some other way to get them to exhaust the room first and then when the room's done with everything cool, allow them to proceed going forward by maybe somehow getting it into their hands. And that's where I think you need to do something like change how the objects, the enemies become animated in this, in this room because everyone knows the legend of King Tut's tomb, right? You mess with something, you're gonna die of a curse. So that's gonna be much more compelling than what you're gonna read next, right? Let's talk about the niches. There are three five foot wide niches on both the northern and the southern walls, about three feet above the floor. A kitchen countertop is three feet above the floor, okay? A table you're sitting at is 30 inches, two foot six above the floor. Just make sure you understand that. So you got something that's about five feet wide and it's three feet off the floor, right? So you could just sit there and walk up to it like at a kitchen countertop and just look at it and go, wow, it's right in front of my face. This is really, really neat. Each niche decays a di uh, contains a diorama, right? Depicting some aspect of tribal life. The six inch tall figures in the display appear to be made of stucco, realistically and brightly painted. The scenes portrayed represent fishing, farming, religion, warfare, the creation story, and the crafts. Now this is a great opportunity for you to like go to the web and look up, you know, what's the creation story in the Tibetan culture or what is a, what is in Mesoamerica? What is their, uh, what's their, what's going on? You okay? What's, what's your, uh, um, <laughs> What's the idea behind the, uh, the farming, religion, and warfare, and all that kind of stuff? So you may really want to go research that kind of stuff so you can get some cool pictures to show them. Like you can go to Pinterest and all that kind of stuff too. Let's go ahead and talk about the descriptions of this right here. Make sure to pay attention to this here first, right? If any, any of the human or animal figures 
are removed from their niche and placed on the floor of this vault, the item grows to living dimensions immediately. Takes two segments, and it, the, the spirits, the ancestors will animate the creature and it will attack. Items taken from this room will remain painted stucco statues with the stats given below on the next page. Let me just highlight that real quick. So this is a real problem. This is such a really, really cool, interesting, exciting design idea, but the odds that someone will pick the, pick the figure up from the display and say, well, I pick the display up and I look at it and, and nothing happens, right? And I, well, I just said, oh, I put it in my backpack and keep it for later on. Or I, I take the miniature and I go take it over here to the diorama and I set it down on the diorama. Or I try to place the farming villagers and put it over here. I take the puma from this scene and put, so the players are thinking, this is a jigsaw puzzle. I got to do something with this. They never think, set it on the floor. It just, nothing's going to ever happen. Never have I ever run this and anyone ever took these figures and pulled them out of their display and set them on the floor. So it's something to think about. So, you know, this is when you took your GM artistic license here and go, you know what, no one's ever gonna do that. I need to make these things come alive because it's kind of cool and kind of interesting. They're gonna be running around trying to figure out how to solve the puzzle. They were eventually gonna discover they can't open a door. So let's go to the niches now. And we have some statistics here and these are pretty good statistics for the kinds of things that might be animated, right? If any of the warrior characters become animated, use these statistics here. They're like AC9. They're just going to get blown open, right? Uh, they have, there is a priest in there. There's a non-warrior, constrictor snake. There's a dog, and there's a puma. So if you have to animate something, you know, those are the stats you're going to want to use. In fact, I got that pulled over too far. Sorry about that. There you go. You can see it there now. Okay. All the other animals are benign. So if there's any description of any animals besides the dog and the puma, those animals don't animate if you sit on the floor. Now, you've in your mind probably got a cool idea like, hey, if you pick it up, and it's, it's going to come alive. The thing I think they thought of is like, well, if you pick the figure up and you start manipulating it and looking at it, no, not Pathfinder 2 manipulating, but if you start manipulating it and it starts to come alive, it would grow in your hand and fall out of your hand. It wouldn't fit in the niche. So they're probably thinking that whole problem of like the Alice in Wonderland, one side makes you big, one side makes you small. So what would a good thing to do, like when you touch it, have it like shock your hand, you let go of it, it falls on the floor. It doesn't break, but instead of breaking, it, uh, you know, dust rises out of it and just starts to swell and become alive. You know, something really imaginative and interesting and dynamic that you've seen in a movie before, right? So think of something like that as a better way for it to come alive than the default description of if you set it on the floor. Let's just go through the alcoves here. So I've numbered them here. I'll just write it up here so you can see it bigger. So we have A, B, C, D. This is kind of cocked angle for me. E and F, all right? Can't open the door. Let's go over here to A. Put him at B, put him at C. All right, so what do you got going on here? A. The first alcove contains a river scene. Olman men and women and children are busy gathering rushes, fishing with nets, and carving a dugout. So of those, which one of those would you consider human? Well, that means little kids, too. So any of the men, or the women, or the children, they would come alive, right? Because it said any of the human figures and start attacking you. That means you're going to have little kid creatures, any human or animal figure, removed from the niche and place on the floor. Or you're going to change that because it's not good enough. So you're going to have little kids here and little kid, you know, women and men coming alive and attacking. Now, you know, you don't want to have a D and D game with your kids in the room, have where you're killing children, right? So you can make it teenage boys or teenage warriors or something like that. You know, think of uh, Lord of the Flies or something like that. So it's Piggy and stuff. And he's got a spear in his hand. So you know, I wouldn't do a situation where the women and, and the children don't come alive. I'd actually give someone a chance to be like, whoa, the little kids came alive too. The spirits are still inside the thing. I think that'd be much more exciting. So the next one is this recess uh, portrays natives farming. They're planting maize, which is corn, and harvesting wheat. I thought this was African type of Mesoamerican thing. Uh, there are several warriors standing guard and a priest in a bird costume is blessing the fields. Oh, that's interesting. This, you know, they do this a lot. At the end of the description, it's the money shot. It's like the punchline. So someone reads the first one. It's like, it sounds like, oh, they're carving a dugout. Hmm, can I do something with the canoe? Is there going to be something with water? Is there a priest? They start thinking, can I take the dugout and the priest and put it in the creation story and cause something else to happen? So you have all these interesting, exciting, creative ideas that players are going to come up with, and none of it does anything. So that's one thing you may want to modify as a GM is a, or a dungeon master in this game is come up with ways that other cool things can happen. So the players are being rewarded for investigating like an archaeologist, you know, multi-pass and fifth element and all that kind of business, right? So the priest, which is listed up here above, he has a couple of spells, 
bless cause light wounds and spiritual hammer. Nothing too amazing. But, you know, remember, the, the party is not a bunch of badasses. I mean, this is level six guy with 58 hit points. Um, where's the other girl in here? Here's the little magic user thief with 43 hit points. I mean, AC5. These guys have like no gear at all. Everything they have is just good old fashioned default off the shelf. Conan the Barbarian, rusty junk. The characters pictures I got from Black Desert Online look three ti 300 times more wealthier than the actual characters really are. I just thought they looked cool and sort of matched the descriptions. So, you know, that's one thing to keep in mind that the enemies in the in the dungeon are not like epic, incredibly, horribly badasses. They're just enough to make it relatively challenging. You're going to get wounded. And you know, when you got 53 hit points, you take 17 damage in the course of a four melee round fight or a four segment round fight, if you do it my way. Uh, you, it's going to hurt, right? So the third niche this is the third niche here, C, okay? Let's point to it from this way so you can see. This is C. i just turn this this way real quick. You can see the shining light of God coming down, right? Um, no comment. The third niche portrays a temple under a tiered pyramid. Natives are bringing small offerings of gold and jade. Hey, I, I can just see the players already going, gold, did you say gold? Did you say gold and jade? Let me move this over so you can see it, sorry. Um, before the temple stands a priest handling a constrictor snake. It's a little false of doom type action going on there. Uh, around him stand three costume warriors. One dresses a winged serpent holding a spear. That sounds interesting. Uh, one dresses a winged serpent holding a spear. Another dresses a bear with razor claws. That sounds menacing. The third representative, a coyote holding a torch. You're like, whoa. So these, these three, you know, priest um, are men, warriors, you know, wearing these cool, amazing outfits and if you look up mesoamerican cultures and look at the aztecs there is tons and tons of stuff that use that type of uh um, um symbolism uh, for the, for the, representing different kinds of gods like the jaguar god or the god of the sun all this kind of stuff so that's really really interesting so c is probably the most interesting one so far right we'll just turn this camera back this way a little bit so you'll be blinded by the light too much so let's go over here to d e and f and see what's going on with that right so put our blurry warrior over here so she's not too blurry all right she's looking the wrong way i know it. she'll keep an eye on this just in case it moves all right so what do you got for the next one so d the fourth niche holds a scene of tribal warfare we're down here now right sorry my producer pope's trying to get my lap <laughs> um, to pick warriors carrying spears clubs hand axes or daggers the warriors on one side are painted black while the ones on the other side are done in red so you have this like you know, good versus evil, red versus black, or tribe one trying to kill tribe two. If you know anything about Mesoamerican history, they did a lot of tribal warfare amongst tribes. They would capture warriors for the tribes. They would force other tribes to pay tribute. A lot of times it'd be in, in dyed in colored blankets and things like that. It's very interesting. If you go back and read your Aztec and Maya history, which I encourage you to do because you, be well, you should be well read anyway, there's a lot of really great ideas, a lot of symbolism that could be happening with a description like this. So a scene of tribal warfare. Wow. How many? <laughs> the black warriors will do battle with red and vice versa. Once they have vanquished their foes, they will turn on the player characters. So that's very interesting. That's probably one of the most interesting things that could possibly happen. So if it was me and I was running this today, my the one time I did it this way, I only put 10 guys in there. I said there's five on one side and five on the other. Even though the warrior statistics were kind of chumpy, Right, the warriors only are AC nine and do have little daggers and hand axes. But if three guys nail someone for five damage, that's going to be fifteen damage. And when you've got someone in the party that's only running around like, let's check her out, right, with forty eight hit points, that's a pretty decent amount of damage. So, at low levels like this, and their AC is so low, they're going to get hit. They're always going to get hit. It's going to get nasty. So, what I did is I, I specifically defined how many on the red side and how many on the black side there was. And what I would make happen is that if you touched any of them then you would get shocked and then the whole scene would come alive and I'd have all the warriors pop out of the niche and all their little figures would pop and rattle and skittle on the floor. You could even make them run across the floor if you wanted to. Make them all run over here and have the red team over at this side and the black team over at this side. Get some kind of minis to represent the different, you know, get some kind of tokens to represent this is the black side, this is the red side, and they're starting to attack each other. And you're like, whoa, man, what's going on? This is really scary. And that would be really bizarre because they start fighting each other instead of immediately fighting you. They might even push you out of the way. 
Another thing you could do is that when they come animated and come alive, if you keep them described like the terracotta warriors in ancient Chinese history, like they look like they're still made out of dirt, and then when you damage and smash them, that they break like a clay pot, that would just make it so much more interesting. None of that kind of idea is really described in, in the module at all. It just says they animate and come alive. You're like, well, they're clay figures, dude. So their armor class is low because they're little clay figures, but nothing's in there to give you any kind of tips like, well, what happens if you bust one open, man? Like, what happens on the inside? They just turn to dust and crumble to dust if you want to make it more supernatural when you smash on them and damage it good enough you know maybe like an arm chops off and it doesn't even doesn't even affect it it's like completely like fighting a statue and when you completely burn it or charred maybe it doesn't get affected by fire damage you know maybe if you do slicing damage on it it just breaks it and makes it shatter so think about all those subtle details because we're in a modern world now this is in 1978 and people want those dramatic type elements happening in their adventure because the players are prompting these things to happen so when you get to that moment in time that's why it's just so fun to make it really happen and really animate. As I said five times before, if you leave it up to the players and they see this little battle scene of the red versus the black team and they don't do anything and they pick one of the figures up and keep a black one and put it in their pocket, nothing's going to happen. You really want these things to happen. They're, just, they're there for a reason. Excuse me. The fifth display, this one's really interesting. That's this one right here, right? Let's put our little rogue dude in front of it. Um, the fifth display that he's staring at blindly uh, is that of the creation of the world. All the statuettes are stylized and obviously non-human. If you've ever seen in the 70s, these old, uh, uh, we've been visited by alien races. I forgot what the movies were called. I actually watched it in the theater. I'm like 10 years old or something. Uh, there's so many stories of a, another alien race came down, the UFOs and, and mankind was placed as a biological experiment by some of the star faring race or whatever. Hey, go find some ancient civilization references. If you look up those conspiracy theory websites, you'll find a lot of people have like analyzed relief pictures that show R2-D2 and everything else in the Ark of the Covenant. Maybe you can pull a couple of pictures like that up and print them up and put them on Xerox, just black and white, and say, you see these kind of figures, they kind of look like this character here. That kind of extra research, just printing some junk on a Xerox machine at the office or copier, um, your character, your players will be like, wow, this is totally awesome. I try to, I, you know, I want to see what it is, what's going on with it, right? So you can say the characters kind of look like this. Show them a picture of something. I mean, those kind of props make a big difference. It really makes the whole adventure come alive. So creation of the world, let's go back to this E. Obviously non-human. Like, you don't say it if it doesn't mean something. You know, Stargate is a great point of reference for Egyptian non-human, if you want to think of it, right? A god adorned in green... I never have figured out how to say this word. Is it Quetzal? A Quetzal? I don't know how to pronounce this word. It's a Spanish word. I'm going to call it Quetzal. Feathers is mixing ash with the blood to form sculptures of a man and a woman. Four towering figures painted red, black, blue, and white are standing about a fire committing suicide with their daggers. Two smaller figures are ringed by the four. The modest pimply one, which I didn't think is appropriate to say it that way. I would just say the one adorned with the most you know, rich and luxurious, fantastic feathers with a pluming headdress, much more, you know, grave goods, much more important than the other ones. I wouldn't say pimply one. It's kind of lame. Um, is being consumed by the fire while the braggart lord of snails cowers in fear. So what they're trying to convey here is like, you know, the attitude of stuff that's related to other enemies that are in the dungeon later on, like the lord of snails and things like that. So maybe just find another way to reword that and make it more dramatic. Um, so this one guy is like, like committing suicide and the other ones are all around it. So Basically, if you touch anyone on the display, have everything on the display come alive and jump out into the room and start attacking people. I think that kind of stuff is exciting. And after a little while, you might even have like the first gameplay session for the first day ends when the first battle fights because everyone's spending all their time meticulously going through this. So the creation story and the red team versus the black team, these are big wins for fun action. You know, little children and, and farmers and maids and stuff, not that interesting. This one over here, A, not that interesting. C starts to get to be pretty cool. This one's really cool. Now, for the last one, let's go to F, right? F, the six hollow shows native men and women engaged in different crafts, weaving rugs and baskets, carving totems, making pots, grinding stones for weapons, and making clothes. The cave-in appears to have completely blocked the west end of the chamber. At short intervals, small amounts of rubble and dirt come spilling into the room. Several large stones appear to have wedged themselves tightly, closing the collapse. I thought it was always kind of odd that they're talking about this crap over here in a description that's supposed to be dedicated to that thing there. In fact, you can't see it, can you? Let me turn this guy over here a little bit so you can see a little better. Let's put dummy over here in front of it and look at it. Hey. All right. So, you know, just scratch that part. Just use the indebted part for the description for number four. Now, in the campaign adventure, this rubble may be shored up and dug. Just skip all that. You know, just make this impenetrable. 
forget this whole idea of like, you could dig your way out in four to five turns, you know, forget all that. Just forget it. Don't even do it. Just let them know that you are trapped, man. It's like a collapsed concrete bridge under the highway. There's no way you're going to be able to get through this. Let's just clear this off nice and clean. This one's thing about nice having the glass later. So in summary, I know I do a lot of summaries. In summary, great opportunity to have things happen here. This is fantastic. The creation story is fantastic. This one here is kind of boring. This one here is pretty cool. This one's kind of boring. This one's okay. So you can make the first one, you can shuffle the order. Now, another trick you can do as a DM is you can shuffle the order so that as the players start to look at the ones, the more and more dramatic combat oriented ones are more that way towards the door, right? But normally if this is a temple and people are coming in the front door and they're coming forward to see the gods of this diorama, the more dramatic ones would be closer towards the asp in the front of the chapel type thing. So it's really up to you. Move them around if you want to move them around. They don't need to be in the order they're in now. The order they're in now, if you've ever seen like in a Catholic church, they have all these different stained glass windows that are telling a story from the Old Testament or something. These type of religious type of layouts like this usually have a sense of order. Usually there's a series of stories that are happening as you're looking at each of them. So, you know, if you want to rearrange to order these things feel free to do so the way they're in there right now kind of feels a uh, random so and after all that whoop to do in business you still get to this hard part well you did all this and you survived maybe you camped and you played the following weekend right and now we get to this part i'm going to turn the camera this way for you Ugh. my cable's not long enough okay maybe we'll turn that off i don't know what do you think leave it like this nah it looks crap the sun uh, that looks like crap. <laughs> okay, I'll quit fussing with it. I'll just leave it like this, right? You can tell the door's there. So when you get to this section, next section here, let's just go ahead and slide this over and go up to the top of the frame here, right? The door, finally, after all this whoop de doo they have the door. Now, in the door description, you can see, oh, you can do the following things. Let's just read it real quick, right? The door is only an obstacle in tournament play, or if the door is swung shut while the party's investigating, forget that. Make it an obstacle. You can't open it. There's no way to open it, right? And they start talking about well, either the key found in the diorama of hunting or use the spring to door when the keys turn the, hidden, uh, the keyhole hidden on the keystone of the door. You're like, wait, 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 what's that? What does that mean now? Go back to the top description. This is really kind of odd. The door is carved with a sun symbol and appears to open into the room. They say that a lot in the, in the dungeon. When they say opens into the room, that means the doors swing in like this. So the doors would swing in like this, maybe even rest up against this wall here, right? They would even have torches and stuff here that you could illuminate, but they're probably long since burned out, no torches on them anymore, right? So when they say the door swings in, that's what they're talking about. So if you can't push the door, it's like that one cartoon from a long time ago where it says pull and the guy's pushing on it. Uh, I forgot what the name of that cartoon, it was hilarious. Um, there are hinges on this side and scratches on the floor. There's no visible lock or handle, although to across the top of the door is a slight gap. Eight holes seem to have been bored into the door. They're about one inch in diameter. One inch in diameter is pretty big, man. So just make sure you remember that. Each one of these little fender washes is one inch in diameter. So you're talking about something that's the same diameter as this miniature, right? That's bigger than a 50 caliber bullet. <clears throat> Probably 20 millimeter or something, who knows, right? Um, in the diameter, but nothing can be seen in them. The door seems to be fairly thick. The lintel is arched and there's a keystone in, at the top. So um, an arched lintel wouldn't really be appropriate for Mesoamerican architecture. That's more of a Roman thing. So I actually wouldn't do it that way if I was you. <laughs> I, would, uh, I would just make the door squared off and put a big, you know, I put a, I put a lintel over, I just make it squared off of this and have the door be a double swinging door like this. All right, I wouldn't try to, uh, make it arch it just doesn't seem right another thing you could do as a designer is make some kind of emblem happen in the middle here and have a slot in there so let's, let's just do a little sketch of that right something a little bit more detailed so say at the top of the door is going like this and you've got this part that sticks out like this right you got a little here's the door frame right sticking out like this and you put this you know sun god type s symbols like this and this slit going all the way across like that with a little niche sticking up, sticking down. And what you could do is describe that, you know, top of that crook could look like actually a key that looks like it would fit that flinches out. Don't make it look like a crook, which would be like this, you know, shepherd's crook like this. That's just too tame. So you can make it where like, oh, it's got a thing on each side. So I could put it in and then turn it and pull it back out. Then it's much more magical. It's like that key in the fifth element, the opening scene where the alien dude sticks his finger in the hole and opens the, oh, they probably got the idea from the Shrana Timosha, just like Spielberg did with Indiana Jones. So, you know, that it would be a great place, in my opinion, for you to make the um, locking mechanism 
you know, discoverable by the players, and then they'll, they'll find this, and then they'll go, oh, you know what, I wonder if that little thing we saw over here was that. You could even do things like, well, it looks like it's made out of brass, or it's made out of gold. Like, don't have any gold anywhere else in the whole thing. Might that be the only thing made out of gold? Um, it may be some kind of ceremonial thing you want the players to do before they can actually access that. Like, do they need to take the gold offerings and the blankets and the food and put it in little trays that are in front of the guy? He's like a priestess, and when you fill the little trays, the little baskets up with offerings, then the little thing in his hand goes from a crook and it magically transforms into a golden key to mean you've satisfied the god or whatever. Like, those are the kinds of mysterious things you want the players to figure out. What you don't want them doing is what they say you could do here, which is like, take iron spikes and smash it. No, don't do that. Make the players figure it out. Now here's the big trick, and I'm gonna stop this video soon because it'll be going on for a long time now, almost 45 minutes. Here's the big trick. This room is too cool to not have cool things happen in it. As a DM, make sure the cool things probably happen based upon what people normally do. When you have things that are too obscure, no one will ever figure it out. And then they'll be stumped and you'll be like, ah, oh, man, I want these guys to have fun. They don't know what to do. You don't want to just keep going, hmm, so what are you going to do? Like, you, you can't sit there and keep doing that all day long. They're going to get frustrated and be like, well, I don't know, dude, what do you want to do? And someone start to look at their phone and they get distracted and people try to exhaust everything they know in the book. You know, bash the door, pry the door, iron spike the door, tie a rope to it. All three of us pull the rope, cast a knock on the door, rest for 12 hours. You know, all this kind of stuff and none of it's going to work on the door. You know, speak, friend, and enter. So you need to make the description of the door kind of reveal this cool focal point over the door like I was talking about. And maybe with the section where you have the little priest guy in here, you know, maybe he has these little bowls in front of him, right? The little bowls that he has laid in front of him. So you have this big crazy priest dude raising his hand in the air with a big crook in his hand. So here's a crazy priest dude standing in the diorama and all these little offering bowls, right? How many of these things are there? There's six of them. Put six offering bowls on the ground in front of them. They're all empty, right? And put an element in every single one of these things here that you can pick up and put in here. When you do that, the guy's crook turns into a beautiful gold key that looks just like the door, like something like that. Now, we all know that if you, if you were the architect that built the dungeon, you'd never do it that way, right? But that's part of the fun of these kinds of mysteries. All right, you don't need to see the eraser. Put that over here. Okay. So, in summary, <laughs> I already said that once, didn't I? In summary, this is a really, 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 really cool, interesting room. It has a lot of cool references you can dig up from National Geographic. You can just use a Xerox machine and print up all kinds of cool pictures. The fighting isn't going to be that big of a deal. You're trapped in a dungeon. The poison thing is kind of, uh, it's not, it's kind of cool, but it's not that cool. But just discovering this whole thing is just tons and tons and tons of fun. And feel free to do things differently. I mean, if you want to change the order and add different characters, you know, do all kinds of things. One of the quick thing I want to do, let me turn this camera off and I want to move this out of the way here, is uh, I want to mention one other quick idea. Whoops, wrong one. I really need someone else to run the camera for me. All right. Let's move this out of the way. Let's get these kids out of the way. Let's do the little isometric picture again, right? Another cool thing you can do is you can actually find pictures on the internet of these types of pictures that would be on the, like frescoes on these back, back wall here. And if you really want to be creative and a storyteller, find six really interesting pictures like from tarot cards or something like that and, and show them the pictures of what the, 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 the diagram is or the, or the fresco is or the tile work that's making a mosaic and show them these things and let those things be symbolism for the puzzle that comes from the main focal point diorama that then leads to something that matches at the door and they'll figure it out. And then they'll be like figuring out and they'll have a little combat along the way. And before you know it, they're like, wow, that was awesome. They played for three and a half to four hours. They figured out how to open the door. You know, maybe when they open the door, the whole poison trap thing is done. Like give everyone one hour to get out of the room. And then you can just remove all the poison junk from the rest of the adventure. It'd be a lot of fun. All right, cool. I know we've been going on and on and on. I'm trying to go really, really fast. I just wanted you to have a chance to, uh, you know, talk about ideas to make a 30 by 50 room, not literally as dumb as it, you know, it's not as dumb. It's just, there's just so much stuff in there now. Like it's never going to happen. No one's ever going to do this stuff. Hope you had fun with it and we'll do another room. I'm going to pick another interesting room in the dungeon and talk about it. And one thing I'll make sure you guys understand, I'm not a tabletop RPG designer. I'm a video game guy. So systems and balance and a tabletop RPG, that's not my forte. Uh, I used to be an architect for 10 years, level designer, game designer for 25 years. 
visualizing three-dimensional spaces and how things are interesting and concept art and building the levels, all those kinds of things. You know, you have people in modern day are groomed on video games more. I'm not saying dumb your game down to be like a video game, but pull these multimedia references from all these other different sources and think about how people think when they see something. They are going to think this is the focal point. They're going to discover that this is the key to get out. There needs to be that relationship between the focal point and the main diorama that they can figure out. And then they'll feel smart. And when they're having, when they're being smart and they defeated some enemies, they're having fun. And that's the reason why you're playing in the first place. All right, we'll leave it at that. Take care. We'll talk to you later. See you.